Welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I'm your host, Shannon Kim, and today we're talking to Joanna Kennedy from Fullsight. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity and this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management to understand how they got there and to talk with people who help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today, we are joined by Joanna Kennedy, the Global Group Data Governance Officer at Fullsight. And normally, this is where our podcast host would read a short bio of the guest. But in this podcast, it's your bio that we're here to talk about. Joanna, hello and welcome. Hello. How are you? Good, good. How are you doing today? Very well. Thank you. Oh, so glad you could join us today. Thank you so much. So tell me, you're the Global Group Data Governance Officer at Fullsight. So first... Uh, tell me, what type of business is Fullsight? Sure. So Fullsight is actually the brand name for an international group um, of companies. We work in industries that are life critical, so aerospace, automotive, medical devices. Um, and essentially what we do is bring key industry stakeholders together um, to enable safety and quality through activities like developing standards, um, and critical process auditing and training. So if you think any time you've ever been on an aeroplane, for example, the uh, safety briefing is always the same. When you're in a car or on an aeroplane, the seatbelts always fasten the same way, right? And that's because those are examples of areas where the industry has said, these are life critical topics. We don't want in an emergency, people to be trying to work out how to undo the seatbelt, right? So they've been standardized. Um, and that's just one example of, of the kind of thing we get involved with. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> very, very cool. So, okay, so as the uh, Global Group Data Governance Officer, what is it that you do? Yeah, so I don't work on the life critical stuff myself. Um, I'm responsible for supporting this group of, of organizations in the com their compliance journey as it relates to two things. Firstly, personal data privacy. So think uh, jurisdiction specific regulations like the European GDPR or the CCPA in California and so on, um, as well as the related laws um, around the use of personal information. So if you think marketing, right, you have can spam in the US, we have um, a, a law called the Privacy in Electronic Communications Regulations, the, the you know, same thing um, as can spam, but obviously there are differences in, in the details um, in Europe. So things like that. Um, and also in my remit is AI governance. Mm -hmm. um, so with the EU recently enacting the first comprehensive AI governance regulation in the world, we at Fullsight are taking that as our benchmark regulation to get started with AI governance. We all know there will be more, um, but you have to start somewhere. And so we're being accountable by saying, OK, let's take that as our starting point. So my role involves developing our AI inventory. You know, what AI systems are we using? How can we govern them if we don't even know what we're doing? Right. Um, and then once we know what we're doing with AI, we can assess and classify and mitigate any associated risks. Um, I also help with the upskilling of, of the team as well, because AI is moving so rapidly um, and is, is going to be, if it's not already, so important for the future. Um, that, that's really a key part of it as well. Oh, that's amazing. So I imagine, you know, any a company or any industry, you know, I mean, setting standards and setting quality standards 
uh, much less doing that as their whole premise for the company. I, I imagine you have a lot of data that you go through that uh, there's to manage there. Um, so how do you work with data in your job? So you're right. I mean, as an organization with the development of the standards, like I say, we then conduct audits. Um, so there's a wealth of data, um, very confidential in some cases, training as well in these areas. So even to the point of the questions people may ask um, in those training sessions, that's data, right? It could be very revealing. Um, but for me, in my role, ironically, it's very important that there's actually no conflict of interest in what I do for governance um, and the actual processing of the data. So I have to be very careful not to get too close to the actual data processing, right? So my role is very strictly around how we adhere to key data protection principles in our use of data. So making sure we are accountable, that we are behaving in a way that's lawful and fair, transparent, making sure any data uh, that we have is minimized, is accurate, confidential, where appropriate, is kept securely, um, and that we only use it for the purpose for which it was intended, um, that we retain it for only so long as is necessary to satisfy that purpose, and that we then dispose of it appropriately, depending on what kind of data it is. Um, and so in my role, I work very closely with different departments, right? Because that that's a big job and it's not something any one person could do. So for example, I work with the procurement team to make sure that any contracts with vendors or partners, um, if they may be using, for example, personal data or AI, um, that we have contract terms that, that say what can be done with our data in those circumstances. I work with IT to make sure, you know, we have, the appropriate cookies um, on our websites that we have a preference center so people can tell us what they want to hear about and we're not sending marketing they don't want uh, to receive. I work with the legal team um, to make sure that any of our, um, as an international organization, we send data you know, all over the world and receive it. So those cross-border data transfers have to be legitimized. So I work with them and, and I mentioned already um, staff training, right? Upskilling the team. So I work with HR on that. So for me, it's not as much about my hands in the data as giving advice and guidance um, for the organization and making sure we are doing all the things we are supposed to be doing. Um, specific for data, we uh, do have a team you know, that's focused on that. And um, for example, I work with them on the data tagging. So you know, what kind of tags do we need? You know, the metadata, right? So we need to know, is it confidential? Um, is, there, is it related to any particular contract that says we must not do anything else with it? Um, is it personal information? Is it sensitive and so on? Is it financial? So we have to make sure all the data in, across our systems um, is tagged appropriately. So that's one way I, I get involved with the data, but again, more in supporting the other teams. Mm, very interesting. I could probably spend an hour just asking you about your program, <laughs> <laughs> but we're here to talk about you and how you got into this role. So let's back it up a little bit here. So tell me when you were very young, say six years old, you know, was this the dream? Did you say, I'm going to grow up and be a global group data yeah. governance officer? <laughs> well, I mean, the short the time is no. <laughs> uh, never crossed my little mind at that point. Um, <laughs> So no, I mean, I, yeah, I don't know that I would have known really what that was. Um, and, you know, as a child, actually, kind of weirdly, I was very interested um, in being a spy. I, I don't know if I saw a oh. James Bond movie or something when I yeah. was young. I have no idea where this came from, in my, you know, where the idea came from. But I you know, kind of, right, what I do now with trying to protect the data and, and data privacy um, you know, I was very keen on knowing as much as I could in a very, I thought, sophisticated, subtle way. Yeah. So, for example, after I'd read my uh, comic books, I used to cut holes in them um, and sit pretending I was reading them, you know, spying. And, <laughs> um, I, I suspect I fooled nobody, you know, as a child. But, you know, uh, that, that was the idea. So, like I say, ironically, because now I'm kind of doing the other thing. And then, you know, as I got older... Um, I 
I found, um, which I think I inherited from my parents, I'm, I, I loved learning different languages. Yeah. Um, so I actually did my honours degree, which I think is like the equivalent of a master's in the US um, in French and German. And as part mm. of that, you know, I obviously spent some time in France and Germany. Um, and then so really at that point, even then, you know, as a sort of young adult, I assumed with languages, you know, what can you do with that? Almost anything and nothing. Um, and I kind of thought maybe I'd become a teacher or a translator. I didn't really think beyond that. Mm hmm. So then, um, so where did you go? So you, you, you've traveled now, you, you speak a few languages. So what's, so what did you do next? What's your first job out of, out of university? Yeah, so I finished university, had a wonderful time, learned a lot. And again, I still didn't really know what I wanted to do, um, sure. except that I didn't think I wanted to be a teacher or a translator. So that was that gone. Um, and so, you know, when I finished university, I was just keen to get out in the real world and earn some money. Um, and so I basically just applied for any kind of job that I could find. Um, and I fell into a marketing role, actually, a marketing coordinator, entry level role. And I really enjoyed it. Um, and so I then ended up pursuing a career in marketing for the next two decades, um, right. working my way up to vice president level. Um, and obviously, you know, the use of personal information, right, is a key part of marketing, particularly direct marketing. The obvious is contact information, right, to email people or whatever. Um, but also you have to think about other information that describes the person, right, that identifies the person. So think about behavioural information, you know, clicking on ads online, right, or what, what websites they visit. So that's what the cookies do. You know, they tell us about the behaviours, demographic right. information right if we're thinking regions countries you know whatever it might be um so uh, you know uh, and are they men or women and so on you know like I say then geographic transactional you know what have they purchased before what have they put in their cart and maybe then left and all that kind of thing that's all data right personal data and then when GDPR came along um in 2016 I was then part of an internal team focused on compliance. So we had you know, me from marketing, there was someone from IT, from HR, you know, key departments. And we worked together to work out what do we need to do um, to stay on the right side of the law, who's going to do what and so on. And I realized I really enjoyed the challenge that represented. Mm. Um, yeah, you know, I think something marketing and data protection have in common is they are constantly changing, you know, technology changes and customer expectations or stakeholder expectations change. The laws change, you know, so they had a lot in common in that way. Um, and because I think because I just showed such an interest in it, I got really quite passionate about it. I was then appointed the data protection officer for that company. And that was kind of how my second career began. Oh, that's fascinating. So, well, let's pick it up a little bit. So, that's I love that we're getting into the to the data piece here. But um, you said you worked yourself up to a VP level. That's uh, impressive and no small feat. So, uh, so tell me a little bit about that journey. Um, you know, how did you um, build that kind of success? Yeah. So, I think there's there's a few elements. I mean, in general. I think everything is part luck and part hard work, right? You have to be in the right place at the right time, um, but nothing falls in your lap, right? You work for it. And for me, I think there's been always, um, like I say, different elements. There's the experience. So through my career, I've had experience of being, you know, a one man band, um, you know, in marketing, kind of doing everything from the strategy and the budgeting to sending the email, you know, writing and sending the emails. Um, all the way through to having a team um, internationally uh, and learning to delegate and, and, and all the rest of it. So uh, I think it's partly experience. Early on um, in my career, and arguably still to an extent, um, you know, I've, I've wanted to make sure, I, I don't know if it was an insecurity or what, but, you know, I wanted to make sure that um, I had not just the experience, but pieces of paper to back me up 
Um, so as well as experience, I'm a big fan of continual professional development. I continue to learn. Um, and we can talk more about that, you know, in terms of the, my data career in a minute. But for marketing, you know, I ended up doing uh, two a, a postgraduate diploma and a professional diploma in marketing. Mm -hmm. um, I became a mentor for um, the Chartered Institute of Marketing um, in the UK. I'm a fellow still of the Chartered Institute of Marketing, as well as a fellow of the Institute of Data and wow. Marketing. You know, I really, I believe in giving back. And I think that's kind of the other part, you know, networking and um being part of a community you know whatever your career I think matters so I think it's partly the people partly the qualifications that give you a good foundation um and then obviously also the experience oh my gosh that's that's amazing um and, and congrats on the multitude of degrees there <laughs> um I Okay, so what kind of company then are you working at? So you're uh, a VP of marketing, you uh, GDPR comes along. So what kind of company are you, what size company, what kind of company you are at at this point? Um, so I was then working for one of the companies in the group that I now represent, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so I started out, like I say, um, working there. Well, so from university, I started working at Virgin. Um, which was, I'd say, a fantastic company for a first job because yeah. it's very, you know, I mean, you get the job done, but it's a relaxed environment. It's exactly what you would think of as a place to work, right? Um, for example, one of the really nice things that I'm sure somebody far cleverer than me worked out the cost benefit analysis, um, but if your birthday fell on a weekday, you got the day off. You know, if it was on a weekend, you're already off, so too bad. But when your birthday was on a weekday, um, you got the day off because they said nobody should work on their birthday. That just gives you an idea, right? <laughs> um, of the place. So it, it was great. It was a great foundation. From there, um, I worked for a not-for-profit organization called PRI, Performance Review Institute, which is, like I say, part of this group uh, of companies. <laughs> so I've really spent most of my career there. Um, like I say, that's where I started out, you know, the only person in marketing kind of they hadn't had anybody before um and so you know really building up the whole thing uh i mean i have um copies of websites you know from the 90s that you know you look at them now i mean not just you know that company any website you look back at now sure. in the night oh my gosh they're hideous um but you know we we had kind of not much before then so I you know that I really kind of owned it and 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 moved the the needle there like I say and, and at that PRI I worked my way up to VP of marketing with an international team so staff in the US um in the UK in China which is another big market um and that's where like I say at PRI we have this internal team mm -hmm. um to support our compliance with GDPR mm -hmm. and became the data protection officer there and from there, the president of the group um, asked me if I would become the group data protection officer. Um, so supporting the personal data legislation compliance for the whole group of, of companies. So again, all around the world um, and uh, yeah, we have stakeholders and, and entities and so on. And then more recently with AI becoming you know such a big deal, my role expanded so it's not just data protection, you know, data privacy for personal data, but also AI governance across all kinds of data. Um, so that includes, you know, company data as well. So we work, as you can imagine, in aerospace, automotive, medical devices, some very large household name companies. Um, and it's very important to them and to us that we behave ethically and lawfully and all those things I mentioned before, I would argue particularly as an organization that helps develop standards, conducts audits and training, you know, on quality and so on, we have to hold ourselves really to a high standard because if we're telling people, you know, in a certain field, you've got to do X, Y, Z and, you know, and we're checking, then in other fields like data protection and AI, we can't be slacking, right? So it's very much a reputation thing there. Um, and that's yeah, really how how uh, it happened. So like I say, part luck that I was in the right place at the right time, but part hard work um, as well. So 
you know, I talked about in marketing, kind of my attempts at least to improve myself. Um, yeah. But I've done the same with data protection um, and more latterly with AI. So for data protection, I'm a fellow of the International Association of Privacy Professionals. Um, I speak at conferences around the world uh, on that topic. So I, I talked earlier about my attempts at least to improve myself uh, in marketing. More latterly, I've done the same for data protection um, and AI. So for example, I'm a fellow of the International Association of Privacy Professionals. I am a certified practitioner in data protection. I'm a certified information privacy manager, a certified information privacy professional for Europe. Um, I recently became one of the first hundred people in the world um, to obtain uh, AI governance professional certification um, through the IAPP. There are many more now, um, but I was in that first cohort, so I'm very proud of that. Um, and I, I am a big believer in vendor certifications as well. So the software tool I use for privacy, um, I have their certification there too. Visit dataversity.net and expand your knowledge with thousands of articles and blogs written by industry experts, plus free live and on-demand webinars covering the complete data management spectrum. While you're there, subscribe to the weekly newsletter so you'll never miss a beat. Um, oh, that's so impressive. You know, and uh, it's what I love about uh, um, what I'm finding anyway about people in these data roles uh, is there's this innate curiosity and this, this desire to learn and be, grow and um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so exciting. Um, and where do you current? So aside from all of these organizations, you know, so it's that where you're getting your education, just networking. Uh, additional resources, more certifications. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I find there's such a benefit um, in face-to-face -face networking. Um, yeah. You know, not only the exchange of ideas, but, um, you know, connecting with potential vendors. It really is a time saver when you're looking for somebody, whether it's a consultant or a software tool, you know, when you're connected to the industry, you just know off the top of your head who to go to. Yeah. And it really speeds things up. Oh, very much so. So um, tell me, Joanna, you know, uh, what's been your biggest lesson so far in your career? That is a tough question. Um, <clears throat> there's definitely been many lessons along the way. Um, but I think it kind of touches on something we've we've just been mentioning and i to me i think my biggest lesson is that really it's all about people um and i mean that in many aspects so for example you know we talk about data and my background like i say being personal data <clears throat> it's very easy to talk about data in isolation and even the legal terminology we use we talk about data subjects rather than people um it really it kind of helps are somehow separate in our minds you know data doesn't exist in isolation you know what i mean it when we just talk about data and data subjects and whatever data processes you know there, there's lots behind that uh, and i think it's easy for us to forget and i think we do our best work when we remember the data doesn't exist by itself you know it's about people about companies whoever it might be and we may be the custodians or stewards of it in a particular context but it doesn't mean we own it um, and we can do whatever we want with it but like I say when I when I say it's it's about people even you know away from like the data particularly I'm thinking more broadly like I said it's about the professional relationships we develop with our peers the commercial relationships with our stakeholders again it's all about people even if you're working with other companies right you're not selling direct to consumers who who are the buyers at companies they're people so you know relationships you know really matter and I think the lesson there is you might be really good at your job but unless you're good with people I think you can only get so far and I think that's been true you know when I reflect on my career you know whether it's in marketing data governance you know probably any number of fields I think my biggest lesson 
um, in my career is that really understanding and relating to people is what underpins everything. I agree. Nobody can do it on their own. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I wish I had learned that a lot earlier in my career. <laughs> uh, I'm sure. We do, yeah. <laughs> well, so um, do you see then the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with um, data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and why? Yeah. So, I mean, there's so many tropes about this, right? You know, data is the new oil and AI won't take your job, but someone who understands AI will. You know, we've all heard them. And it's certainly something I think about, not just for the immediate future. I mean, you think about AI, you know, two years ago, who'd heard of chat GPT and now it's everywhere, right? So who knows what the next two years will be, but then think, my gosh, 10, 20 years ahead, what will it be like for the next generation? You know, I, I, I think about this. How do we prepare our children for a future? We don't even know what it's going to be like, and let alone preparing ourselves, right? So I don't claim to have any answers, frankly. But what I can say is um, there's one author, um, a, a professor, an Oxford a University professor, I think, um, who has written a couple of great books on this topic. So I'm just going to talk about those for a minute. Um sure. So his name is Daniel Suskind, and he's written a book called The Future of the Professions and another one called A World Without Work. Um, and I was lucky enough to hear him speak, actually, which and then bought his books afterwards. So I'm <coughs> going to paraphrase here. But essentially what he talks about is we all understand and accept that certain jobs lend themselves to automation. OK, and we generally think these are manual roles that require little or no judgment. They're repetitive jobs. They're non-creative. But we generally don't think that roles that do require judgment, that are creative, that aren't repetitive. We don't think they could be replaced by technology. And his position is we're wrong. Actually, any job that has parameters, right, has rules, machines could be trained on, right? Think about law, essentially it's a set of rules. Medicine, again, essentially a set of rules, architecture, you know, and so on. And so how will that impact the future of work? You know, will we be reduced to kind of overseers, right? Managing the data where the machines are actually doing the work as such. And then, you know, we will just be looking at the data rather than relationships like I talked about that I think is so important you know will we only be involved in those edge case decisions that aren't black and white right I, I don't know um but what I do feel confident about rightly or wrongly is that if we don't have ethics professionals governance professionals working hand in hand with technologists right thinking about the the other side of the coin you're not just can we do it? But should we? And what if? Um, I do think we, this is just, this is my opinion. I think we could sleepwalk into a future that we're unprepared for. I um, There's actually a quote from Jurassic Park, the movie, um, sums this up where um, Ian Malcolm says, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. And actually, can you tell I love the franchise? There's another Jurassic, I think it's Jurassic World movie. Um, and he says, we're racing towards the extinction um, of our species. We not only lack dominion over nature, we're subordinate to it. And if you take out nature and put technology in there, again, you know, in my opinion, if we don't really think all the various possibilities through, not just you know, what we're hoping and planning for, I do think there is a greater risk to our future. So gosh maybe I'm coming across a bit negative um so you know <laughs> we work in this field I believe in it you know we can't turn back time technology yeah. is such a benefit to our society in so many ways my point is only you know we have to make sure that we're managing it properly yeah so I do see you know I, so I think that you know jobs in data governance and in data ethics uh are going to increase as a result in that demand yeah i think so i think the challenge is really um persuading companies that those kinds of roles are as important as you know the data scientists and the technology specialists um because you know companies of course 
they want to make a profit. I, I get it. I mean, that's that's where it comes from. I, I say to everybody when they ask me, you know, can we do X, Y, Z? You know, I say, look, these are not my decisions to make. Right. If you put the data governance person in charge of decision making, we won't do anything because my role is to minimize risk, right, for the organization. And really, the way to eliminate risk is let's just not do anything. So that's why it's not my decision, right? And that's the right thing. You know, I will you know, give my professional judgment, right, based on my experience, based on my knowledge and what I see out happening in the world. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would hope you're right that those kinds of roles increase because I do think they're vital. Yeah, we, we've certainly seen a, a lot of uh, data modeling, new data modeling jobs anyway, as a result of AI, just to right. <laughs> make sure, sure the correct data is getting into those models. But yeah, uh, but, well, yeah. that matters a great deal. I mean, I, um, I facilitated a discussion recently. So I... Uh, got to mention but yeah i was recently appointed um there's a, an international privacy community and i'm the london chapter chair now um congratulations had, thank you we had a, a discussion um about data privacy in the context of ai um mm -hmm. and so you know one of the points about that like when you're talking about the quality of the data and the models and so on is bias of course um, and how do we, again, think about fairness and ethics and lawfulness? You know, how do we make sure that our own in inherent biases, like we all have them, we may or may not be aware of them, right? But we all do have them. How do we make sure, I mean, I don't know if it's even reasonable to say that they're not creeping into our AI systems, into our data, into our decision making, but how can we be more self-aware, I guess, um, it's a challenge. It really is a challenge. I agree. Another challenge, you know, in on that regard, <clears throat> when I think about, like I say, the two parts of my job, um, with the data protection, you know, and um AI governance, we all know AI needs a wealth of data to really have any valuable output, right? Where data protection principles um say the minimum data you you know, process the minimum data you need because that minimizes the risk you know if you've got data sitting all over the place like who's controlling it what is it who knows yeah so just have them if you have a breach you know oh my gosh and suddenly there's all this data out there so just have the minimum you need and so data minimization is a challenge like i say in the context of ai and there's many other in my opinion really fascinating um Conflicts might be a step too far, um, but challenges, let's say, um, but, you know, in, in the field of data, especially with protect, data protection, data privacy, when we think about AI. Um, another one, for example, is automated decision making. So the GDPR has a whole clause all about automated decision making. Um, and that's in general, you think about you can go on websites, right, and apply for a loan and you get, oh, we'll give you an answer in 30 seconds. Well, there's no human doing that. Right. It's right. it's a machine, like give, you know, <clears throat> giving you that response. And the GDPR says you as a person have the right to challenge that and say, I want a person. You know, I think my circumstances are so particular. You know, the machine couldn't understand. You know, I'm an edge case, effectively. And I want a person to be involved in this. Um, and we think about where we see the benefits of AI is efficiency and productivity, speed. So if we're going to have people saying, no, nope, I want a person now involved, at what point does that start to negate the benefits of AI? Mm -hmm. um, so like I say, there are challenges um, around data privacy, data protection and AI. Well, Joanna, I'm beginning to wonder a, if you sleep, <laughs> you are amazing and what you're accomplishing and how much you're involved in. Um, but so what advice then would you give to people who are looking to get into a career in data management, who, who might want to get into um, a data governance role and get into these data ethics and, and, and uh, governing um, responsibilities? Yeah, I, I think for me, I would say, 
you know, I, I obviously just talked about my somewhat non-traditional path, right, into mm-hmm. this field. So I think I would probably encourage people not to be too focused um, on a strict path, right, that's totally data career centric. Some of the most interesting people I've worked with have had careers before their current ones. There was um, a head of IT who used to be a teacher. Um, There's a lawyer who was an engineer. And I think having a more varied background helps them bring a perspective that would otherwise be missing. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think really I would say focus on what you're good at uh, and let the rest take care of itself. But I will caveat that that you know i've i've talked obviously about my strong belief in continual professional development so even now for example i am studying for my masters in law um specializing in data protection and intellectual property wow. uh, i just like i say whether it's just a personal insecurity or you know a a, a desire to continually improve i don't know where the balance sits but I, I enjoy learning for sure. Um, and, you know, I think maybe that's um, the biggest piece of advice I'd like to pass on is actually from my dad, um, who I mentioned years ago, I did two marketing diplomas. So I actually um, did one and then I was contemplating another. And I said to my dad, <clears throat> at that point, you know, I had my degree. I had this diploma and I said, nah, shall I bother, right? <clears throat> and I said, nah, shall I bother, right? Doing doing another one. And he said to me, you can have money and lose it. You can have a house and lose it. You can have a partner and lose them. Mm-hmm. But if you have knowledge, if you have education, no one can take that from you. And it really hit home. Um, and I think that's another reason why I continually strive to to learn, because no one can take that from you. And I think that's you know an, a, another piece of advice I'd give people. Oh, that is such good advice. I, I really, really like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and let me say, I, I can't claim it. It was my dad. <laughs> but we may be quoting your dad a lot. <laughs> Oh, I love it. Joanna, it has been such a pleasure to talk to you. Um, if people want to learn more about the, um, your company, Fullsight, you know, what, where would they go? Um, yeah, so fairly straightforward, fullsight.org. Mm-hmm. And what about the chapters you mentioned as well that you're involved in? Like if they want to get involved in those or any other groups? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the privacy community I mentioned is called Privacy Connect. It's all one word. Mm -hmm. Um, they have chapters, cities all around the world. Um, like I say, I chair the London one, but they're everywhere. Um, and, and yeah, I recommend them. They, they organize events, I think in each location, maybe a couple of times a year, um, Mm -hmm. great topics and discussions. Uh, then I also mentioned the International Association of Privacy Professionals, um, who I strongly recommend. I attend, again, they have... Um, events around the world, um, Europe, US, Asia, um, always great, great uh, networking opportunities, great presentations, lots of opportunities to get involved. So yeah, those I think are the main ones. Oh, I love it. Oh, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you. Like I say, I, I really, again, I just, let me reiterate, I think we, I could go up for hours in any one direction <laughs> about your current role, about some of your past roles and learnings, but um, <laughs> that is all the time that we have for today. Um, and so thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. Oh, no, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. And to all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up to date in the latest podcasts and the latest in data management education, you can go to datarocity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time, stay curious, everyone. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Thank you.